Lucio Meyer, you are professor uh, for astrophysics at the University of Zurich. In which fields of astrophysics uh, are you interested? So my main interest is in understanding the formation of structure in the universe, which means understanding how galaxies form and develop, but also the formation of smaller structures like planets or supermassive black holes. But today I think we will mostly talk about the formation of galaxies, which is really the most interesting topic that we are working on at the moment. But uh, tell me, how do you simulate a galaxy? So what we do is uh, we start from the basic equations of physics that we think describe uh, the behavior of matter in the universe, not just the matter that we see, but also the matter that we don't see that is called cold dark matter. Uh, and then we put all these equations uh, in a big program that is run by a large supercomputer and it can do uh, millions of operations per second. And then uh, we wait until the simulation computes a sort of synthetic universe from the very beginning after the Big Bang to the present time. And then we look at what the simulation has produced based on these fundamental physical equations. Uh, and we hope that the final product is a galaxy like the ones that we observe in the sky. But this has always been a problem until now. Uh, for almost 20 years, people have been used to uh, develop and improve these techniques to simulate what I just said, a galaxy evolving and forming in, a, uh, in the universe. Uh, but they've never been successful because, uh, for example, the galaxies that was formed in the simulation was typically... Uh, much smaller in size uh, and much denser uh, than a real galaxy. It didn't have an extended disk of gas and stars as a typical galaxy like our own Milky Way has. And uh, it was never clear what was the problem. Uh, at some point, uh, about eight, ten years ago, uh, the problem was so severe in the community of cosmology and astrophysics uh, that people began to the, cast doubts about the cosmological model itself. Uh, which is uh, verified on many other experimental uh, grounds, uh, for example, the existence of the cosmic microwave background radiation, the Rayleigh radiation for the Big Bang, but was uh, not able, at least in this model, to produce a reasonable galaxy. So we even started thinking that our fundamental understanding of uh, cosmology and so fundamental physics in the end uh, had some big loophole. Uh, so being able to show, uh, as we were able now, uh, that a galaxy like our own galaxy, which is typical, can form in the standard cosmological theory is an important success, not just for understanding galaxies, but for uh, cosmology as a whole, for our understanding of uh, the physical laws of the universe as a whole. And just in this day, you published with, together with uh, colleagues from the University of California an article entitled uh, Forming Realistic Late-Type Spirals in a Cold Dark Matter Universe. Yeah. What is the impact of this uh, paper and uh, what does it exactly mean, this title? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So the title actually contains the main ingredients of the paper already. So it, again, it's a paper where we show that we can uh, uh, be successful where uh, all previous attempts were uh, unsuccessful. So we can simulate the formation of a galaxy that has the right structure when it's compared to a galaxy seen in the sky. For example, our own galaxy itself which is the one that we know best from astronomical observations. And it does uh, obtain this realistic galaxy using the standard cosmological theory. Uh, the standard cosmological theory that has been developed progressively in the last 20 years uh, assumes that the main component of matter uh, is not the matter that we see, and not the hydrogen atoms that con 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 constitute most of the matter that is visible in the universe but is actually made mostly by an unknown component, which is called dark matter. And this component is called cold dark matter uh, because we think that uh, the temperature uh, of these particles uh, is extremely low compared to the temperature of other particles that were formed uh, at the beginning of the universe, so that's why it's called cold. And it is because of that that this matter cannot emit electromagnetic radiation. So since the very early times, when all the universe was still quite hot, all the matter components were still quite hot, this matter component very quickly became very cold, it became incapable of interacting with electromagnetic waves. The only way that it was able to see the rest of the matter uh, is through interaction with, via gravity. But because it's most of the mass in the universe, in the cosmological model that we believe, 
uh, as astrophysicist, uh, it means that the gravity produced by dark matter is the most important source of gravity in the universe. And so galaxies, all the objects that are uh, uh, clearly seen as individual objects in the universe, must have somehow formed into a big condensation of dark matter, because that's the most important source of gravity. They're put together by gravity, and they're put together mostly as dark matter galaxies, with a little part which is visible, and that's the part that we call a galaxy. So that's the interesting thing that in the model that we pursue for the last two decades, galaxies are actually surrounded by this huge halo of unseen matter called dark matter. And only the inner part of the galaxy is made of visible matter. And that's the one that we are actually used to call a galaxy. But it's only a, a small fraction, a bit more than 10%, not much more than that, than the total mass of the dark matter halo of the galaxy. And, and so in order to produce a, a realistic galaxy in such a model, you need to end up with an object that has the right proportion of dark matter and visible matter so that the galaxy rotates at the right rate the rotation is given by the gravitational field, so it's mostly given by the amount of dark matter. But uh, the, the structure of the galaxy that we see is actually what we see in the visible matter. So we have to get both the dark matter and the visible matter in the right proportions and with the right physical properties. And this has always been the problem. And as the title of the, book, of the paper says, we have now uh, obtained the first realistic replica of uh, a, a real galaxy. And the impact of the paper is very important because it shows that uh, it's not necessary to change the cosmological model, it's not necessary to uh, change uh, any uh, fundamental part of our understanding of how structure develops in the universe. What we have always uh, postulated is actually correct. What was not correct was the numerical model, it, that is the type of model that is implemented on the supercomputer to simulate the evolution of galaxies there were insufficient uh, uh, aspects in the models that people were using to compute the evolution uh, that were not uh, up to the challenge, if you want. Uh, for example, a process that was uh, modeled in a, in a way that it was not significant, uh, was not sufficiently good uh, to produce uh, the right result is the process of star formation. So how stars form in a galaxy. Uh, uh, the nice and, and funny thing, if you want, is that although uh, we are talking about an object that is dominated by dark matter, because what we see in the end is the visible matter, we need to be able to describe how stars form and shine in a proper way. We have worked as astrophysicists on star formation for many years, but there's never been a clear connection between a community that works on star formation and a community that works on cosmology and galaxy formation until the last few years. And by making this connection, not just us, but many other people, we started to realize that modeling the formation of stars was a crucial aspect of understanding galaxy formation in cosmology. i give you an example of why that's crucial. Actually, the success of the model is drawn from there. When stars evolve, uh, uh, if they are massive stars, uh, several times more massive than the sun, they explode the supernovae. The supernovae are known to be uh, one of the most powerful explosions in the universe. They can be seen from very large distances. They actually used to see uh, galaxies very far away. When a supernova light, lights up, we can say that there is a galaxy somewhere in the distant universe. And so they've been always crucial for cosmology. But uh, when they explode, they release a lot of energy into the galaxy, into a much larger region than the site where they were formed. And describing this, the position of energy is crucial because it sets somehow the, the typical temperature of the matter around uh, the star. And this typical temperature set by the explosion can, can be set uh, even uh, many hundreds of light years away from the site of the explosion. So in a big portion of a galaxy, essentially. And so we found that when these explosions happen, especially very early on at the beginning of uh, the process of galaxy formation soon after the Big Bang, the explosions happen in a very uh, clustered way, which means very close to each other. And so they accumulate a larger amount of energy because they are exploding very close and in a very short amount of time. And this cumulative effect of the energy deposition is so strong that it can really take some matter from the galaxy and throw it away in what we call outflows or supernova-driven winds, and it reduces the amount of baryonic matter, visible matter, compared to the dark matter. 
and that makes the galaxy more dark, but also it makes it more diffuse because the baryonic matter that remains is not concentrated in the center anymore because some of it has been removed, but it's more distributed in an extended disk. And this is why, in the end, we can obtain this nice extended disk of stars and gas that looks like a real galaxy because we have removed a lot of excess matter that would have otherwise produced a very compact and dense galaxy, which was the problem for all the previous models. And so this, this um, new way of describing star formation has been possible thanks to the fact that we have been able to go to much higher resolution in the simulations, which is driven by the fact that the supercomputing power has increased and our codes have gotten better. And so now we can resolve individual star forming regions, these places called mo giant molecular clouds that before we could not resolve, so we could not actually describe the process in a proper way. For your simulation, you use the Monte Rosa supercomputer, which is on uh, Cray XT5 at the Swiss National Supercomputing Center, CSCS, uh, in Switzerland, and additional supercomputers at NASA. Mm. How much uh, computational resources did you use? Yeah, so this project was actually a massive project because it, it lasted more than two years uh, and used between the Cray uh, Rosa in at CSCS and the NASA Columbia cluster uh, in, in uh, California, uh, it used uh, uh, almost 5 million CPU hours overall, of which uh, most of them, about 3 million, were used uh, uh, on, on, on the Cray in two subsequent projects, essentially, which were all part of this investigation of trying to form a realistic galaxy. So it's a accumulation of 5 million CPU hours and more than two years of actual work on the, on the problem. And it has also a predecessor because last year uh, we published on Nature another paper uh, which was trying to do the same thing for smaller galaxies, which is simpler because a smaller galaxy, uh, as it can be guessed, because it's smaller, uh, it needs less uh, resolution elements uh, to be modeled to the level of detail that one needs to resolve star formation and supernovae driven outflow. So it was the first problem that we attacked because it was the simplest one. And we showed that we could be successful in showing, in producing a, a reasonable dwarf galaxy, which, which is the smallest type of galaxy that we know in the universe. And then we uh, decided to be brave and move on to try to form the typical spiral galaxies, which was a much more in, in massive uh, computation. And that's why it required so uh, many CPU hours and such a long time to analyze and, and, and understand. And, and it, it would have never been possible to do this without the aid of supercomputers, in particular of Rosa. Uh, and, and you know, the same computation would have taken uh, many hundreds of years without uh, uh, having access to these large supercomputers. Compared to your colleagues at other universities worldwide, uh, do Swiss researchers have a competitive advantage in using the supercomputers at CSCS? I think we are in a very good position uh, right now in Switzerland uh, because we have uh, world-class supercomputing facilities, but we have a, a, a relatively small number of groups that actually uh, 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 perform uh, massive parallel supercomputer simulations, not only in astrophysics, but also in other fields. So the ratio between the quality and, the, and the, uh, uh, the level of the technology that is available in supercomputing and the number of users is extremely good. Uh, much better than in other countries where there are also uh, good supercomputing facilities, but then the number of users is much higher and uh, the fight uh, to be able to run calculations like this is, is much stronger between different groups. And one example in our field, uh, Zurich is uh, essentially uh, the, the, the place where computational galaxy formation and computational cosmology uh, is done. Uh, and so we can count on, on, a, on, a, on a sort of uh, leading uh, position uh, in the country, uh, uh, which uh, because uh, then allows us to have uh, access for this type of calculations uh, on computers like, like Rosa in a sort of uh, unique way. There are no other groups that, that work on the same topic in, uh, throughout the country. This puts us uh, immediately also in a uh, very high position at the, inter at the international levels. Uh, for example, our colleagues in, in California, you know, they, they did not, you know, although the U.S. has a lot of uh, computational resources, they did not have um, the possibility of 
computing as much as we could compute here in Switzerland. You know, in the end, most of the computation was done here uh, because they had to compete with many other groups to get uh, granted the same amount of computing time that we had granted. In the background, we see a nice movie, which is the result of uh, your uh, simulation. We want to say some words about what we see. Yeah, so what we are seeing here is uh, at, at the stage that is uh, already very advanced, so it's sort of halfway through the simulation, where the galaxy has already begun to form. There's clearly a, a, a spiral uh, structure. Uh, 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 what you see is actually the visible matter, the gas and the stars uh, of the galaxy. And it's clear that there are spiral arms uh, that look uh, extremely similar to uh, the spiral arms that are seen in galaxies like our own Milky Way. Mm -hmm. And uh, every now and then there is some matter falling from outside. You know, it's, the, the universe is much bigger, of course, than this small piece that we are simulating here. But in the simulation, we take into account uh, that the universe is much larger by doing what we call periodic boundary conditions. Essentially, in the program that we run on the supercomputer, we have uh, 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 an infinite number of replicas of this piece of the universe. And so the gravity that the piece of the universe feels is much more than the actual mass that is in the box that we are looking at now. And sometimes there is matter falling from outside this box that we see now. These are smaller galaxies that sometimes collide with the galaxy that we are trying to model, and they become part of it. Uh, these are typically these small dwarf galaxies that are seen to collide with our galaxy in the real universe. We have evidences that our galaxy has collided with some of them. And so not only the single galaxy, but also the interaction with the smaller galaxies around is all included in this simulation. This time you simulated uh, one galaxy. Will you, in the next project, simulate the uh, whole universe? Well, the uh, whole universe, of course, is maybe too bold, and you know, uh, eventually, uh, in the very distant future, uh, we might try to do something as close as possible to what you just asked. But uh, certainly, as a next step, what we can do uh, is uh, going from simulating uh, one particular galaxy at very high resolution, as we've done here, to try to simulate at least a population of galaxies. Indeed, we have already tried to do that, not to this level of sophistication, but with a much coarser resolution uh, a couple of years ago, again uh, uh, at the Supercomputing Center uh, in Lugano. Uh, uh, it was one of the first projects that, project that we ran on, on, on ROSA. And we want to go back to this project uh, and uh, try now to redo it uh, with the same level of detail that we have in this particular simulation. So in that particular case, we were trying to simulate a population of about 20 galaxies in what is called a galaxy group. A galaxy group uh, is a, a, an object that uh, contains a few tens of galaxies uh, and is a typical, uh, if you want, the most typical uh, uh, gathering of galaxies that we see when we uh, point a telescope in the sky. So you can say that it's a very typical structure. And so if we will be able to simulate uh, 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 10 or 15 galaxies at this level of resolution, so we're able to really make a population in a group of galaxies, this would be uh, another huge milestone because then it could be used by astronomers, by people who really observe the universe, to, be, uh, to see whether we are able to produce not just this type of galaxy, spiral galaxies, but also other types that are seen in groups. For example, big elliptical galaxies that are typically much more spherical in structure than these. They don't have spiral arms because they don't have uh, 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 the same uh, uh, type of arrangement of the visible matter. They are typically more diffuse. They have a big uh, a central uh, stellar nucleus with very little gas. So they're very different from this type of object. And even in that area, there is not a, a simulation that, that can be successful there. But we believe that the same approach that we used here and we used in the dwarf galaxies might actually be taken over to these other types of galaxies. So in this way, the hope is that we can really close, eventually, the problem of galaxy formation as a whole in the near future. Thank you, Lucio Mayer, and uh, good Thank luck you. for your <laughs> next simulations. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk about this. And yes, I'm happy to report as soon as we have some new interesting results.